Um, we, we, have, we have just a short distance to go, but I think an important distance to go. When we started this morning, we spoke about um, wanting to be a little bit further forward with regards to our fiscal fluency. Um, you've heard a lot today. There's been a lot of really rich content. Um, and if, if you're like me, it, it's, it's both beautiful and in some ways almost challenging to try and get your head around all of it. Uh, I want to remind the group that the conversation that we are about to have is really about understanding this issue of restructuring and realignment and reallocation of resources in a way that borrows from what you've heard. So here are some sectors, some industries, some examples of what others have done to kind of look at how to move the dollars around, look at where there are opportunities for increased efficiency and to move dollars further upstream. And is there a way in which we can not only talk about it, but think about it as kind of pioneers in this discussion around financing population health? So it remains, I think, for just to be a little bit more of a bow put on the conversation and then to um, do the work of the workshop um, to have some significant conversation, and I'll walk us through in terms of uh, how we'll do that once Bobby is done with his presentation. So I want to introduce to you, gentlemen who probably needs no introduction, uh, Bobby Milstein, who's a director at Rethink Health, um, an amazing strategic thinker, or maybe he'd say strategic rethinker, um, <laughs> uh, but a binge. Um, <laughs> who's spent a lot of time thinking about this issue of, of how to actually move the needle on um, resource um, realignment and reallocation. So could you welcome Bobby as he comes, and then I'll take it over from him thereafter. His welcome sounded just a little less than the last set of welcomes, so could we try that again, people? <laughs> there you go. Perhaps I should just stop right now at, at the peak. Um, so this is less presentation and more about context setting. We, we started this day with a um, somewhat dry and technical title, right? Building Sustainable Financing Structures for Population Health. And what we heard is essentially stories of economic transition. In the justice space, you know, we've got a prison industrial complex in this country that has generated mass incarceration and manifest waste, human and economic terms and how the principal actors in that arena have managed now over the space of a decade or a decade and a half with the pioneers um, who built that field to begin to lay a path of how investment and reinvestment can lead to a very different set of, of results. Um, and similarly, in the energy space, we've got a sort of a petro-industrial complex that is manifestly harmful, and how do, how do we begin to transition away from that? Um, the challenge for us in population health is how do we deal with a uh, economic transition, an industrial revolution in the way that health care is structured and financed that really pivots to one that is much more about population health and health equity and the human sort of development potential that comes through investments um, across an entire spectrum. So we're, the workshop here is really about structural parallels. And uh, you know, I think one of the things that this last panel said uh, you know, might have gone by quickly, but you know, anything of value can be financed. right? Anything wasteful presents efficiencies. I, I went through a, you know, a school of public health and never really got that idea. You know, I've worked in institutions that spend a lot of time talking about the evidence of where there is action and never once heard the discussion about how do we actually turn that into financeable value, right? So, so I think that's really the agenda for our population health work here is, is how do we insist on not just promoting what to do, but, but how are we going to pay for that with, with a mindset that says not begin with the financing as a constraint, but bring financing experts and maybe take a cue from colleagues who've, who've been restructuring industries you know, um, toward similar co-benefits 
uh, and, and begin to learn with them exactly what are the um, fuller statement of value and efficiencies that can be gained through a serious, serious population health innovation. Um, so the, the reason for this, this sort of um, context setting right now is we, we structured this workshop to dive very quickly into some very deep waters. And I know some of you <laughs> might be feeling underwater already. Others would like to go even deeper, that we only really scratch the surface of exactly how does the details of that justice reinvestment actually work financially? How long are those projected savings? You know, do they get the magnitude of savings that they want? There's a half dozen questions that I and maybe many of you have about getting deeper into these things. Um, and then we turn to energy, which is a very different arena with very different terms. And so, so um, today's purpose was really to name the fact that there is an array of different um, uh, sort of frontiers in this discussion about how to, how to um, first bring clarity to what the nature of the, uh, the, the, the sort of action agenda requires, and then come to what are the, and we heard this from Rafael at the top, what are the institutional arrangements? and um, sources of money that could actually animate that agenda and make it, make it real. Um, so that's kind of what this slide was. This is, this is uh, an attempt, an unapologetic, unapologetic attempt to sort of simplify all of the array of changes underway in financing for population health into, into 10 quick categories. I, I just, before I sort of do the, the summary as a little heuristic, um, I just would point people to the booklet put together and, Staff and the planning committee did an enormous amount of work to gather 10 pages of links uh, that sort of offer some more detail and more variety than could have possibly been covered in this workshop here. So, so for those that really have an appetite to delve into this work and to hear more stories about it, you've got 10 pages of starter um, issues. And I would, I would say the idea is not to have mastery over that, but to find one title that attracts you and, and sort of see what people are thinking and doing in that space, because there's something in this list for almost everybody. Um, so uh, my colleagues at Rethink Health, principally Stacy Becker, and, um, and in dialogue with lots of people in this room and others, have tried to see if we can't so sort of begin to summarize the sheer variety of innovations that are underway that have some bearing on financing for population health into a little um, list of, of 10 structures and a number of examples. So, um, this is ordered roughly by their relative dependability. The, the, the key phrase in the mission of this roundtable is to assure dependable resources for the work that goes on. And, and I, I think it bears um, repeating once again that the vast majority of what multi-stakeholder stakeholder collaboratives do right now to advance their agendas is based on very short-term, very fragile financing. We've done a, a pulse check of a couple hundred of these partnerships and, and the, the, the sheer variety of what they're doing is impressive. Their ambition is enormous. Um, but the way they finance it is, I mean, to, to say it's on a shoestring is really even uh, generous. So, so that's kind of what the one to 10 sequence is here. And what we've done almost deliberately today is to, um, is to concentrate on a class of financing structures that are essentially about gain sharing, that are essentially about recognizing co-benefits, that are, that are predicated on the idea that investments um, can actually deliver yield, and that yield can be done, can be thought of strategically as what's the next new thing that ought to, ought to, ought to do with it. And we've seen this in the justice space. We've seen this in the energy space. We'll come back again on how it plays out in the health space. But it's, this is, this is um, still fragile, and it's you know, perhaps uh, not uh, the most extreme level of dependability, but it's a long way away from the, the main way that most population health gets funded under grants and contracts or donations and prizes. And, and I don't even mean to dismiss the significance of that. We've got um, multi-philanthropic initiatives like Convergence and the Build Health Challenge that um, are demonstrating sort of pioneering ways of pooling philanthropic money to do much longer term and and um, more uh, profound kinds of investments. Uh, but th that's sort of just the beginning. Um, th and we can quibble with sequences on some of these. There, there may be more blocks than you know, a strict gradation. But, but there are also a, a series of in-kind and barter agreements. Sometimes can be much more durable even than the short-term grants, where people see themselves as in business with one another. And the development of cross-jurisdiction sharing agreements uh, in, in, um, in regions where there are multiple health departments that actually find ways of negotiating operating agreements that deliver economies of scale. The, the, you know, the 
uh, the, the anchors to those do it in an in-kind way, eventually that can become contracted and much more formal as well. But, but this is an important uh, sort of asset to doing business differently um, in a way that's hard to count sometimes, but it's got a, it's got a real economic force to it. Um, I think folks in this, con in this community, I think, are well aware that the, the conversation around hospital community benefit and the, the value to the public of that, of that um, tax break uh, is, is delivering questionable value. Dave Kindig and colleagues have written, enormously, uh, written um, very clear papers about exactly the size of that value and what are we getting for it. Um, but suffice it to say, that's a field changing very rapidly. And, and we ought to begin to see, or have begun to see, and we ought to see more um, expansion of investments in community health improvement, community building uh, from nonprofit hospital sectors. Um, add to that the, the, the sort of growing but more fraught arena around healthcare payment reform. These are so, sort of an epic shift to some degree between um, the you know, sort of fee-for-service value-based payment, I mean volume-based payments shifting to some kind of value. And, um, and we'll probably have another session led by Sani someday about the, the, the connections between the population health and MACRA. But uh, you know, the, the, the regulatory framework around uh, payment reform is a significant economic incentive that I think, like some of the um, policy changes we've, we've heard today in other spaces, can signal a need for other kinds of investments to flow differently. Um, lots and lots of attention around the whole class of loans and, and investments. Uh, I won't enumerate these one by one. There's lots of links in the resources, but in the banking sector with the Community Reinvestment Act is, is a structure through which lo lending occurs in new ways that had never happened prior to that um, legislative commitment. Uh, the expansion led largely by the Federal Reserve and RWJ to bring community development and health together is, is um, uh, an arena where co-benefits are now becoming much more routine and, and an equity agenda for investment is much more, um, is, is much more prominent. And then the, you know, this is sort of growing field around pay for success and impact investment or even an explicit discussion of the divestment of, res of, of investments uh, around oil or tobacco can actually represent a profound question of, okay, we're going to divest from these harms, but what should we invest in? And that, that conversation sometimes is a point of great leverage as we're dealing with institutional assets. Um, there's a, a class of things that uh, often goes unnoticed, but is important in terms of multi-sector collaboratives and how they do business. Um, the ability for multiple institutions to actually provide dues, uh, you know, sort of routine contributions to do work that they cannot do alone, um, or even to uh, negotiate the uses of, of legal settlements. Uh, obviously, the famous ones around tobacco and, and the BP Deepwater Horizon ones are our big ticket ones, I know the Public Health Institute has an entire program in, in California to look at legal settlements that happen through, uh, you know, sort of device litigation or, you know, other variety of harms and actually questioning what, what, when the state gets that judgment, what is the best investment that can come through that means. It's, it's um, a, a, a point for um, public discourse about exactly what that money should go to do. Um, we, we have to add in the gain sharing agreement section the, the development of hundreds of accountable care organizations uh, and, and uh, you know, Medicaid waivers that actually present a question about if you are going to redesign the delivery of health care and, uh, and then share in its savings, the, the question is who are, is a party to those deals and what are they doing, how are they allocating those resources? The narrow form of that is accountable care organizations, of which there are hundreds, um, and the larger form now becoming more and more prominent are accountable communities of health, where this question of who is a party to the total cost of care in a region um, is expanding, and the scope of investments can expand accordingly. Um, we've got the, an array of things that have to do with the functions of government, taxing, uh, sort of appropriation and mandates, um, and, and, uh, and, and um, taxation and tax credits. Uh, we've got this long string of the so-called sin taxes, gambling, tobacco, sugar, and carbon now. Uh, the, the, um, the carbon story that we heard here this morning is a poignant question, right? If, if investments that come through that carbon cap and trade system are, are um, 
are going to be invested, they're going to be invested in ways that probably help people and planet. So are we as public health professionals thinking about what comes through that cap and trade taxation system as a, an investment in population health? It's a, it's a fair question for whether our planning is really clear on that. Um, and then an, an array, and this Debbie began the day by saying it's not all about new mechanisms. Some of the oldest, most tried and true mechanisms may not be used as fully or as strategically as possible. And so the, the array of, of tax credits, low income housing tax credit, and enterprise zones, uh, and more are, are um, important mechanisms for advancing this agenda. Um, I put wellness trusts in this category, um, acknowledging that it's in some flux because the, the early generation of these trusts were. Um, fueled by taxes on healthcare expenditures and then, and then um, gathered together and reallocated for a population health agenda. That's what Massachusetts did. Um, the new generation of wellness funds that are going to be formed in California with the Accountable um, Communities for Health there are, are really non-governmental and it's not obvious yet who's going to bring all the resources together to, to make those flourish. But that conversation is now happening in many places and I know TIFA has a report on this that's out or coming out very soon and uh, saying yes. Uh, and, and so this is a space to watch, right, as, as there are structures through which there are no single owner but may actually be a conduit for investments and reinvestments and strategic um, redirection of resources. That's a place that will matter. Um, and then I just end with, with a, a, a reminder that the, many of these assets are not easily parsed into clear owners. And so the agenda of community wealth building, um, thinking about institutions, even hospitals, as not just deliverers of you know, individual services that get reimbursed separately, you know, each, each transaction independently, but that the decisions that an institution like Kaiser, for example, has done a lot in this space to think about who do we employ, how do we invest, how do we procure all of the, the resources that allow us to do business represent a much more enormous economic impact in places than, than just the services that they provide. And so the full idea of what an anchor institution can do by living out its anchor mission, and that's true not just for hospitals but for universities or even f philanthropy and government, um, to have a much more significant consciousness of institutions as having a role and a long economic stake in the places that they do business. Of course, the, um, the, the further extension of that idea would be employee ownership, collaboratives, and, and you know, this is just scratching the, the surface of an array of things that are meant to um, have people in regions have a much greater stake in the local economy. There's an entire line of thinking about local living economies, which we as population health champions um, ought to be listening to, right? A local living economy that works economically is probably one that also works um, f for health and equity as well. Um, and then lastly, I mean, one could put this probably anywhere on the list, but we, we can't ex exclude the idea that a lot of these other changes have to live in concert with uh, uh, the business models of institutions. And here there are a number of examples where um, uh, to do business in a changing world, uh, institutions are finding ways to redesign what they do, what they sell, who they sell it to, at what price. And so this could be a very long list and a subject unto itself. But you know, CVS's unilateral decision to not market tobacco is a good enough exemplar for the top of the, the, the tip of the iceberg here. Um, so that's my job here is before we go into breakout groups and, and try to make sense of the essentially the structural analogies that we've been offered here today, we've seen you know, four historical examples in the paper that Raphael and, and Anthony uh, gave us. We've seen two examples, deeper, more fully developed in justice and energy and recognize that even when it comes back to the you know, the, the, the scene that you see in your own areas of practice, there are at least, uh, you know, 10 categories in which uh, financial innovation is, un, is flourishing. And the question is, can we um, direct these resources in ways that actually are strategic, that will, that will yield uh, multi-sector co-benefits and, um, and deliver the, the kind of opportunity for health, equity, and um, sort of regional economic prosperity. So uh, that's my, uh, my job here. We're going to turn to the breakout groups in a minute, but if there are any clarifying questions uh, right now, we can, we can do that. This is merely offered as an imperfect way of, of recognizing that the few examples that we had here today are just that. They're, they're just examples. Um, any clarifying questions at this point, or, or we can turn to what is an um, exercise designed for each table? <clears throat> 